All right, y'all. This is uh, Bro Research Radio, episode 22, season three, episode, episode. four. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll redo that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we won't. Come on. We got to keep it. We got one take. That's it. We're on episode four. It was tight. I was just, uh, I was... <laughs> that was real good. <laughs> No, so we got Evan on the show, and, and we've been trying to put this together for a long time now, probably way too long, maybe even like a year. Um, and we we wanted to get Evan on because we in the strength and conditioning world, strength and conditioning kind of there's a there's the conditioning part of that, and we have this. Before I even get into this, though, I, I wanted to tell a little story about that I think both of you will appreciate. So pause. So back when I was 13, a young whippersnapper. And I was, I was uh, for actually like the first time that I saw someone bench press for reps, 225. I was, I just walked in there and just like this aura just came off this guy. He was, he was a senior and I was 13 years old. And this dude was bench pressing 225, lost my mind. Uh, and then I was heartbroken that he got off and he was a skater dude. Right. And so like, I was, yeah, this dude, all he did, all he did was, all he did was skateboard, lift weights and talk to chicks. And uh, and so he That's didn't play football, completely, completely blew my mind. Uh, and so th- it was just this reminder that the iron can can bring us together. And right now I'm the odd man out, right? Like you guys, you guys bond. I might not even be in this conversation after after like 30 to, maybe even 30 to 60 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I think what that <laughs> says is that you, you, you can't, you can't bench a lot if you don't skateboard because that I think that's what that means. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what you you're saying. You got to start with skateboarding. You got to set your 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 cardiac output with skateboarding first to well, uh, facilitate the energy demands that you'll need. I, to I just wonder like 25. how that works. Like what was the what was the 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 stream there? Was it like what was the causal mechanisms? Was it skateboarding, talking to chicks, then bench pressing, or was it like how? What was the order? I would guess skateboarding, bench pressing, talking to chicks, but I could be wrong. Skateboarders, you know. I've never so, talked to girls before, so I haven't this one. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the same boat, but one of the things that you do have to consider, so, I mean, we all understand physics. If you have a kite, the kite picks up air and it goes into the sky. So the more you're bench pressing, the more you get your lat spreads, the more air you're going to pick up when you're skating. Uh-huh, so yeah. you're able to get more hovered. air off the it, it seems obvious when you really think about yeah. it. And, the, and then the girls, the girls are watching because yeah and then you then it just leads yeah. to, you know one thing leads to another mm-hmm. uh this this episode is not about lats bench pressing or uh skateboarding unfortunately it is about energy systems so uh we're gonna hopefully slay some sacred cows and the conventional energy system model you know you have your atp at phosphate creatine system which is quote unquote three to six seconds you run out of that and then you start using your glycolytic system oh my god lactate lactic acid uh lose your mind and then after about two minutes you get into this aerobic system and like that's useless uh so why would you ever do that so just you know train in a six second window eat donuts and salami and you'll be you'll be really strong and jacked and probably not get chicks uh <laughs> Your, your wife is never going to let you release this episode. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. So, Evan, what is the problem with that conventional ideology of energy system training? Yes, I mean, one, if we look at that conventional model, so one, there's a lot of um, segmentation within it. So you have that zero to 10 seconds, 10 seconds to two minutes. And if we first acknowledge, like, what are some of the good things about it? Sorry, my dog's looking at my shoulder right now. It's delicious. That's probably going to happen a lot while we're on here. Um, so <laughs> that's key. That's key to the transition there. Yeah. So one of the things that is good about that model. So they acknowledge, like, if you look at the traditional energy system chart, basically what it will show is if you're zero to 10 seconds, it shows that all of the energy systems are working in conjunction with each other to an extent. But the further out you blow out that model, the less accurate it becomes based on everything that we see in the literature. So then it will say two seconds to 10 seconds, where entirely using the phosphagen system, glycolytic and oxidative system, apparently ATP stores don't do anything past two seconds. Then you go past 10 seconds in that model and it shows it's entirely glycolytic and oxidative. Apparently, phosphagens can't do anything past 10 seconds. Then past two minutes in that conventional model is entirely oxidative. 
So for whatever reason, once we go past that time domain, it's believed that we're using aerobic metabolism for all of our fuel. But the issue is when you start looking into some of the research or even what you could observe in live time, if we were to use something like NEARS, I know there is some contention of how accurate that is. Um, it doesn't appear to be accurate. So if we're talking about like what happens when you first contract a muscle, we're going to be primarily um, using ATP to support the contraction. But in order to continue contracting a muscle, we're going to need ATP to be continually replenished. And one of the issues is that there's not a lot of glucose inside a muscle. So there are very little glycolytic intermediates. So we need some kind of source of non-oxidative energy to keep the muscle contracting. So one of the things that you see in the biochemical evidence is that glycogen phosphorylase is going, it could increase its activity really rapidly. So it's believed to make a lot of energy contributions on that millisecond time scale. So that would mean that ATP from breaking down glycogen and glycolysis is restoring PCR. One of the things that you see in the literature, um, particularly in Chung et al's paper, is they're showing that PCR is probably consumed in about 40 times greater the concentration than previously believed. So if we're using that classic model and we're not using like the um, PNMR techniques, that classic model wouldn't look to be true. But if PCR consumption is 40 times greater than we traditionally believe then PCR is being used to replenish ATP, that already throws a little bit of a wrench into that classic model. Are you able to hear me right right now? Landscaper <laughs> just popped up outside of my window. <laughs> so you're, that, you're that was that was amazing that you kept that yeah. going through like uh, through a, <laughs> the dog a hail storm. <laughs> <laughs> I just see a guy pop out of my window wearing a face mask <laughs> with a neon green hat on with a freaking leaf blower. Well, you're Sorry. exceptional at conserving energy. You don't do your own lawn. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've, I've got an HOA to take care of that, so we're pretty, we're pretty well taken care of here. <laughs> I think you said some. I think you said some stuff that that might have thrown people for a loop. It's one, of the, one of the things about science is it's a, it's a, essentially a product of what we can measure, right? And so we've been able to measure these things at a lot smaller timescales. And you, you just like dropped a, a ton of nuggets there that people may have no idea what's going on. I know the first time I heard about this glycogen shunt and like using glycogen phosphorylase to re to replete ATP. And what really helped me kind of even begin to understand this is is really the the structure of glycogen. And I thought of it's almost like this. It's almost like a lung in the sense. It's just like because it's it's so branched, you can just take so many things off of it. The surface area is so large, and so like phosphorylase and synthase. Phosphorylase is going to chop off glycogen, and in that process, you're going to it's you're going to get ATP. So that that's essentially the it's not a lot of ATP. It's not like aerobic metabolism where you get 36 ATPs or whatever how many ATPs you get. But glycogen phosphorylase is essentially what the muscle could use to replete this ATP on a millisecond time scale, right? Yeah, and one of the things that you just mentioned, so everything that we know is a product of what we can measure. So one of the things I always keep in mind, like I think we know enough at this point to say that that conventional view probably isn't accurate. But who's to say that the glycogen shunt model is accurate? Because previously they would use the freeze clamp measurements to try and like look at PCR kinetics in a muscle and freeze clamp has a resolution of like 100 milliseconds. So you couldn't measure anything happening in less than that time period. Where now with some of the newer techniques, they could get it down to a resolution of about eight milliseconds. So that's how they're able to find a lot of these new observations. But what if shit's happening on the time scale of 0.2 milliseconds or 0.1 milliseconds? We have no way of measuring that. So I don't know if we could say that we really know how bioenergetics work, but I think we could probably say we know how it doesn't work. And I think that's where we could pick apart some of this old model at the very least. Why do you think so? What what really kind of drove me nuts about this is like Schulman's not like some no name researcher. He's a guy out of Yale. The first time he published this, I think, was before, 1999. Was the first time he came out with this. And so like the the fact that this thing this this ideology isn't cited or isn't more widely talked about. Why why do you think that is? I mean, what comes to my mind first is that Max Planck quote of like science advances one funeral at a time. I mean. If this model, if the conventional model is not accurate, think of all the feathers that that's going to ruffle. Any training textbook that you buy, okay, the energetic section in that, it's wrong. 
any exercise physiology or physiology textbook you look, that's going to be wrong. So I think hypothetically, if we, if they do find that his model's accurate, maybe that will be um, more well known in 10 to 20 years. Because you even look at George Brooks's work on lactate, as early as the 1980s, George Brooks was saying lactate isn't a poison and it's a fuel for oxidation. He was kind of laughed at for 20 years after that. And in the early 2000s, more people started acknowledging, oh, maybe lactate is actually a fuel for oxidation. And maybe lactate isn't like a poisonous metabolite. And now that's pretty mainstream. Most people don't think like mm -hmm. lactic acid is poisoning us during exercise. But it's also 40 years after he proposed that theory. Glycogen shunt was proposed maybe 20 years ago. So maybe in another 10 to 20 years, that will be a little bit more common. You'll see that in training textbooks. So I think it could largely be a product of just science takes a long time to kind of take out the old guard and let something new come to fruition. So how are you using this? Is if the, A lot of people, they're conventionally using this old model to like they're basing their, their intervals off it. They're basing their rest times off of it. So how, how does this change what you do in practice? Yes, yeah, so I think in practice, if we're using that traditional model, we'd think, okay, you're doing a pure sprint and that's ATP, PCR. You're doing a one minute all out sprint, that's glycolytic. You go longer, it's oxidative. Where that uncouples for me is I'm not thinking in terms of what energy system are we using at any given point in time. I'm thinking that everything's on a spectrum. So if we're going very easy, we're going to be over delivering oxygen. If we're going balls out, we're going to be utilizing oxygen at a very fast rate. So rather than segmenting things and saying 10 seconds is fundamentally different from two minutes, which is fundamentally different from two hours, I see it as, okay, 10 seconds in two hours, they're not fundamentally different. The only thing that differentiates a pure sprint from a marathon is the rate that oxygen is being, being utilized. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing else that is that different between those two types of events. Interesting. So, so oxygen is, is always going to be a part of the equation. Yeah, I think like oxygen utilization is going to respond immediately to load. And oxygen is going to be part of that energy transduction process at all times, whether it's direct or indirect in the same way that like there's this notion that oh, if we're going five second sprint all out, it's a lactic, like there's no lactate. And it's like, well, we're circulating lactate around the body at all times. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't do training that is a lactic. And I know that's kind of pedantic to be like, well, lactate's circulating at all times in the body. Like there's no such thing, but I think the terminology that we use is important. If we say we're anaerobic lactic and we have lactate and oxygen in the muscle, like maybe we need to change that terminology because those are both things that we could very easily measure, but people are still using these terms that don't really make sense. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the topic of lactate, just real quick, can you, can you talk about what the, the, the true role of lactate is? Yeah, so this is one of those things where I'm like, I don't know how accurate this is but i think it's fair to say that lactate is not that like fatigue byproduct so what it looks like is we already talked about what happens during contractions but when we're talking about what's happening between muscle contractions um we're going to need to um resynthesize glycogen and pcr and then kind of reestablish ion gradients like getting potassium into the muscle getting sodium out of the muscle um in Part of that is going to be resynthesizing glycogen from ATP, and that ATP is going to be produced by oxidizing lactate. So lactate is going to be more of a fuel for oxidation. So it's part of that energy transduction process being ver versus being something that prevents someone from continuing and being something that's a primary source of fatigue. Where is all this happening inside the muscle cell? So like what, what's getting shuttled where? Or for lactate in particular? Yeah, you're like, is this happening? Like, because you got, like, this is all on the cytosol, or where where does this happen? Like, if lactate is like a carrier to the to the mitochondria, is yeah, that right? Yeah, so that's what becomes kind of confusing because you see a lot of the lactate shuttle research, and I don't know if that really jives well with the glycogen shunt model. So that's where I'm kind of not really sure what we could say is like the thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It's just not there yet, yeah. Because mm -hmm. so, it would, it would, it, we would think it would be that would be pertinent for, because that would also, uh, I mean, when things get super deep and you can actually look into, I guess you can already measure mitochondria and a and a muscle at this point, but I, I would think that the proximity 
uh, of these things are, are probably important. So if, if just looking at like capillarity and fiber distance and that type of stuff seems to be important for certain things. I wonder if the same would apply for where glycogen is in a, in a tissue and, and how you're able to get it to the necessary structures. Organelle. Glycogen's outside the muscle, right? Like glycogen is like in bundles outside of the muscle cell. Yeah, and one of the things that's confusing about lactate in particular to me, if we're talking about what its function is, and just going back to that, like there is some literature showing lactate interferes with excitation contraction coupling in a muscle. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, how do we reconcile that with this view that lactate is a fuel for oxidation with this other view that lactate might be a fatigue byproduct? Like these are things that don't really make sense in relation to one another. And I think one of the issues is fundamentally like, how the fuck do you measure metabolic stress? Yeah, yeah. Like, is it phosphate? Is it inorganic phosphates? Is it hydrogen ions? Is it lactate? So, like, with lactate, it becomes very tricky because it's like, okay, it's accumulating. Maybe someone gets pushed to the point of failure. Maybe something else is correlating with that interfering with excitation contraction coupling, and lactate just happens to be the thing that we're measuring. Or maybe it is something that interferes with it. And it's like, I don't know how to even... how someone would even go about parsing those things out and better understanding those processes because you can't really quantify metabolic stress. And if you can't quantify it, how are you going to draw a correlation? If you can never draw a correlation, how are you ever going to figure out causation? So I think this stuff is all very messy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the hard part about just metabolic stress is an independent driver of hypertrophy. Or So how do you which is the the giant conundrum right now because like how can you have metabolic stress without muscular tension um on the system and, and maybe you can maybe this is a good time to jump into hypoxic training because that seems mm -hmm. to that seems to seems to show some independent benefit which is interesting mm -hmm. i mean i don't know i don't necessarily know could you have very high metabolic stress without mechanical tension I think you, if you just occluded someone, could, couldn't you? I mean, if you just, because there are. Yeah, but you don't get someone. hypertrophy occluding walking. Yeah, exactly. You do, though, in, in really untrained individuals. That's, yeah, but I mean, if you look at some of the BFR that. research, like if I do a set of curls right now and I take it to failure, or you have someone do a set of curls and then you add BFR after the set, that doesn't equal more hypertrophy, even though it's more metabolic stress. So mm -hmm. I think it would be hard to say like metabolic stress is driving hypertrophy where if we're thinking like okay maybe like if i was thinking how could metabolic stress lead to hypertrophy it's like okay well if we're getting mod metabolic stress we're probably desaturating a muscle and we're probably getting peripheral muscle fatigue if we're getting metabolic stress we're also probably training heavy enough that we're cutting off blood flow to the muscle like if you're getting compression reaction and you're just squeezing a little bit out of the blood blood out of a muscle and you contract I can't imagine how you could possibly be desaturate a muscle doing that unless you're taking it to like an 150 rep set, which you're probably going to be limited by central fatigue before you ever desaturate the muscle. So assuming we're training heavy enough that you're restricting blood flow, you're getting that desaturation in the muscle. As you get peripheral muscle fatigue and you're getting increased motor unit recruitment, like if you watch someone do a set, like we talk about, you need to start grinding to get hypertrophy. Well, if you're getting venous occlusion, as you're progressively desaturating that muscle and getting more and more blood flow restriction, you see velocity slowing. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of shifting up the force velocity curve where you could kind of overlay blood flow and THB reactions with force velocity. If you're moving at like very high velocity with low force, you're getting muscle compressions. If you're moving at max force, low velocity, you're getting arterial occlusion. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a 30 rep max to failure, is it the metabolic stress that's leading it to growth? Or is that as I'm getting closer to my 30 rep max, I'm moving up that force velocity scale and I'm finishing with maximal force or maximal contraction force? So do you think what, when you talk, when you think limiters there from a hypertrophy standpoint, from, from a hypertrophy standpoint, like what do you, what are you thinking? Because there's a, there's a lot going on. You're training people for getting for hypertrophy specifically, you're mm -hmm. using you're using these type of models. What are you doing? Yes. Yeah, so the way that I'm thinking about hypertrophy, like initially, the way that I thought about it is okay. If we get someone who occludes easy, it's going to be easier to hypertrophy them. So one of the things that we've looked at is, like in the hypertrophy literature, as a rough estimate on a population level, we could probably say if someone's training between thirty and ninety percent of their one rep max, we take the set to failure. It's probably effective on a set per set basis. 
Obviously, training at 30% of your one rep max is fucking terrible, so most people probably aren't going to make that an effective set. Mm -hmm. And then, for the best of me, I don't know how to pronounce this name. It's like Lis Lasavicius. Do you know what paper I'm talking about, where they're looking at the low-end cutoffs for hypertrophy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they found that it's as low as 20% of a one rep max for yeah. people, some people. So, presumably, someone who is getting hypertrophy at 20% of their one rep max they're probably getting venous occlusion at 20%. On a population level, most people get venous occlusion between about 30 and 70% of their one rep max. People who are high occluders, they might get venous as low as 20 to 25. People who are low occluders, they might not get venous occlusion until 50% of their one rep max. So I think you could kind of shift that 30, 90% hypertrophy range up and down depending on who that person is. So previously in my mind, I thought, okay, maybe we make someone very deliberate and limited. We speed up their rate of oxygen utilization in the muscle. We basically detrain them so they don't have as good cardiac output. And then there's someone who occludes the muscle at 20%, and it's easier to get them to desaturate a muscle and get motor unit recruitment. But then as I started thinking about that more, I'm like, well, there's also research on, um, like you guys sent something on um, capillary density, but there's other research on showing like, why do we stop growing? And part of it is diffusion distances. Yep. If you're not getting oxygen to the fibers, you're probably not going to get maximally jacked. So if we're mm. driving delivery limitations in people, it's like, well, does that limit it? So the model of that- Did you like, just say cardio is important? Is that what I, is that what I heard so, right there, bro? As a fighting words. <laughs> maybe, words. maybe, but then it's like, okay, so hypothetically, <laughs> let's say that you're that person that does a lot of aerobic training. Now you do a lot of work to improve your cardiac output. Now you're not someone who's occluding at a very low percentage as your one rep max. So what I've been thinking is maybe we drive a delivery limitation in someone, make them that occluder, and then we increase oxygen flux. So now we improve mm -hmm. delivery and utilization in tandem with one another. So there's more oxygen going through the system, but they are still limited by delivery. So you're kind of attacking it from both sides. Do you ever worry that you're just like playing with a non-critical variable? Yeah, I mean all the time. So that's the kind of thing where it's like, well, ultimately the interventions that we do in practice still need to be effective. So I think things like this, like even trying to create a system model, it's trying to understand what's happening under the hood. But at the end of the day, like we have to look at the applied research and see what actually matters in practice because we could probably come up with something pretty convoluted based on limited research and it might not be effective where we have a good idea of some of the things that are effective. So in my mind, I'm like, well, maybe let's take what we have in the applied literature and tweak it a little bit with what we know about physiology and see if it's more effective that way. So do you think that you could potentially get someone to be able to handle the, the recent study where they had people not, they either dropped 22 sets per week on their quads on, or they had them go up by 20%. That was like, they took their historical volume and then had them like incrementally increase it. Do you th like what I'm thinking in my head is like maybe there's a way for us to and Ryan and I talk about this a lot like maybe the limiter for them isn't their ability to create muscular tension maybe their limiter to accumulate more volume is some of these is some is is a you know is a respiratory limitation it is a delivery limitation so that they can't they can't really take a lot of volume in one in one in one go yeah, and one of the things that I've been thinking about, so um, are you familiar with what uh, infrared thermography, so like thermal imaging? That's camera stuff, right? Yeah. So not, I, not super. Okay, oddly enough, it's something that's starting to be used for COVID now for seeing what people's temperatures are, but one of the projects that I've been working on for a little bit um, for like a team sport military application is using both NEARS and infrared thermography for load monitoring. So some of like the basic theory, our bodies should be um, thermally balanced from left to right. So it's not saying that like the whole left side of your body should be the temperature, but if we're looking at your right bicep versus your left bicep, they should be thermally balanced. And as thermal asymmetries are highly associated with um, either true injuries or injury risk, depending on the degree of um, asymmetry. Mm. So one of the things that you see is if someone has like an acute inflammatory injury, that appears as a hyperthermic region. And if someone has a hypothermic region, it usually indicates poor metabolic activity in that muscle. So if I get an athlete who like tore their ACL six months ago, 
and they have like sub recruitment of the muscles on that side, you'll see a big hypothermic region. So on a thermogram, it's going to come up like a big blue circle surrounding those muscles. And one of the other things that we'll see if we're using mirrors is if I'm monitoring their left versus right quad, that muscle that's hypothermic on the thermogram. They can't desaturate. Yeah, they can't desaturate. So you're like, okay, they're probably not utilizing on that side. And I think um, if we're talking about like that idea of acute to chronic load ratios, if you're increasing volume too quickly, you're going to be accumulating more muscle damage than you're probably capable of handling. And if you're accumulating muscle damage, what we basically see on a thermogram is um, we would see, uh, what was I going to say? If it's chronic, we would see decreased activity in that tissue. On nears, we'll see decreased blood flow to that tissue. We'll see decreased resting SMO2, and we'll see impaired utilization. So it's possible that people aren't responding well to those big increases in volume because they end up getting a sub-recruitment of that tissue because you're putting them at risk of injury. So I think there's things like that to consider as well. I don't know how much I'd hang my hat up on that, but I think it's something to consider. Yeah, are you using that essentially to auto-regulate training? Like if they're not, if they, if essentially if they can't desaturate, you're not going to train them that day or that muscle? Yeah, so I've done it both ways. I've trained people that way, and I've also just collected this data on people for weeks or months, and I just don't do anything to their training and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So from what I've seen, like if you're training a muscle and it's not able to desat and they're not recruiting well in that muscle, there are things you could do that day that do help it. So I think it's more of like, could you get that muscle to desat? So for example, one of the things that I see, if someone's stuck in thoracic extension and you put like a moxie on their delt and you have them do lateral raises and they're not desatting, it's like, well, you could adjust the position of their axial skeleton, get them in neutral, and then they're utilizing in their delts. So there's simple things like that that you could change people's ability to utilize O2 in a muscle, either by adjusting the position of their skeleton. Um, it could be like simple cueing with like their hand, their wrist position. It could be adjusting the strength curve of a movement. Um, and if things like that don't work and it looks like it is actually an issue in the muscle, then that's where I wouldn't be pushing them too hard that day. That's super interesting because it, that it kind of maybe explains why some of the repositional work works so well. <laughs> a lot of things you will see that you'll see in performance too. Like if someone is just in a super shitty, what we would call a shitty position, uh, you'll, you'll actually see a drop in performance a lot of times. Uh, just, and it's probably just a, like a neural thing, just your brain shutting it down and understanding that it's, it's probably not a safe position. So uh, that's, that's pretty crazy that you're actually picking that up with, with oxygen saturation. Which, which leads to the, like, there's a lot of kickback and a lot of pushback on nears being that it's superficial. It's not telling you what's going on deeper in the muscle. Um, it's not telling you what's going on in other parts of that muscle. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it might, it, there might just be way too much noise in the reading for it to be useful. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the other, the other big knock is like, uh, you're, if you don't nears without Doppler isn't very useful because you're not getting blood flow in and blood flow out. So you don't necessarily know what those total hemoglobins, you don't know what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. You want to, you want to comment on that? Yes. Yeah, so I think one is like a lot of times people just talk about nears and we need a parse side. Are we looking at like a device that measures tissue oxygenation index? Are we looking at something that measures uh, muscle oxygenation? So one of the things that I've seen using some of the devices that measure TOI is I think those ones are really difficult to get any kind of meaningful data from. So if we're talking about something like a Portamon or something like a Humon, um, those it's looking at all of the tissue under the sensor. So you're getting O2 sat in the skin, the adipose tissue, and the muscle. So if you, like hypothetically, let's say you're desaturating the muscle 50%, a tissue oxygenation index measuring device might say 75%. You don't actually know what's happening in the muscle. So also when you're looking at blood flow trends, like you think about oxygen dissociation curve change, the skin temperature changes, you're going to shift the oxygen dissociation curve, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't know if the temperature changes are occurring in the muscle, in the adipose, in the skin. So I think if you're using tissue oxygenation index, I think there definitely needs to be Doppler or something that could help parse that out. With muscle oximetry, I'm less sure of that. Um, there's a recent paper by Andre Feldman out of the University of Bern, and it was a nears validation on a zero to 100% scale using Moxie. So one of the things that we've looked at, if you put a human on 
um, say your right leg and you put a moxie on your left leg. Now I take a cuff and I'm using Doppler to confirm when you get arterial occlusion. And we pump up both of those cuffs until we cut off blood flow to the artery. What we see is the oxygen trend and both of those are the same. But on the moxie, you'll drop out at about zero to two or three percent oxygen. Or on the human, you'll be at like maybe 15 to 30 percent oxygen when you occlude the artery which is telling us that not all of that measurement is taken from the muscle. Where on the moxie, if you cut off arterial inflow, you get down to 0% desat on the muscle. So I'd feel more confident saying that the signal that we're getting from a moxie is cleaner, where something like a portamon or a human, it's a little bit dirtier of a signal because we can't parse it out. But So what, it, like, Nears is measuring hemoglobin and myoglobin mm -hmm. desaturation of oxygen? Like, because that, that's another point of contention too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so depending on the study, it looks like the near signal could be anywhere from maybe like 50 to 70% myoglobin versus hemoglobin. And what NEARS is doing, it's not actually an absolute measurement. So it's a relative measurement. So there's also that factor as well. So one of the things that I would consider, like if you're using it, you can't really take the numbers that you're getting at face value. You're looking at trends versus numbers. Got it. So you're not comparing this inter-individual, like you're not comparing this person to person, essentially. No, you, you can't compare it person to person. You even need to consider, I don't even know if you could do intra-individual measurements over longer time scales, because one, it's going to be different in different muscle groups of your body. Two, you could have different body composition changes. So what I'm primarily concerned with when I'm looking at NEARS is the trend of those blood flow or the proxies for blood flow and the oxygen saturation trend over the course of a set or over the course of a workout versus being able to extrapolate that out to pure numbers and saying that those numbers have any, give us any meaningful insight. Gotcha. That's helpful. Uh, so when you're, when you're looking at this, just talking with you, and we've, we've been able to, to talk a lot outside of this, but like you're primarily and say a, um, like a hybrid athlete, like a CrossFitter or someone who does a lot of things, you, you've you found that like people are delivery, there's a certain avatar that you've been able to pick up and like the, the truth, like the success leaves clues, right? And so like you have your delivery limited athletes who are, tend to be more jacked, right? Mm -hmm. And not very good at, not as good at CrossFit. Yeah, or at least not as good anymore. Like if you look, I mean, think of what the average games athlete looks like right now versus like 2012. They're way less jacked now than they were in 2012. I think um, particularly with the format that the sport used to have with like the regional selection process, I think the sport used to select more for delivery limited athletes in the past than it did now. And one of the things that we see as well, like it looks like delivery limited athletes get good very quickly, but they just hit a lower ceiling. So one of the examples, and I know he'll be fine if I pick on him for this, because he's one of my buddies. He's a coach at TTT, Kyle Ruth. He was an Olympic level sprint swimmer. And within about four months of doing CrossFit, he almost made the games. And he just got good very quick, but he's probably the most delivery limited person I've ever seen. Like he's literally a walking occlusion trend in the past. <laughs> And he ended up hitting a low ceiling. And one of the things that we've seen as well with a lot of athletes that are those bubble level regional athletes, or maybe they're like, they make regionals in the past, but they'd get like 25th, 30th, 30th place. They're very delivery limited where it looks like all of the top competitors in the sport are those respiratory limited athletes. So they might be very strong. They might carry a lot of muscle mass, but they have phenomenal blood flow to the muscle. And even the ones that look very muscular or dense, when you press into their muscle bellies, you're like, they have no tension in the muscles. Mm. And one of yeah, the- Yeah, that was weird, dude. That was, I did, I, I like, I had, I was working with a massage therapist in Canada and like the best CrossFitters, like they felt like cats. It was so, <laughs> it was, dude, it was so wild to me. I was like, dude, what is wrong with your muscles? There's not like, it just moves all around. Well, one of the interesting things, and I know this is anecdotal, like, Two to three years ago, we had a bunch of top games guys on site, and we were watching them do max vertical jump tests. And um, you'd watch the guys that were like pretty explosive. They'd do a vertical jump like someone that knows how to jump would. They would dip a few inches and explode up. And um, watching two of the guys that got the worst scores on it, who happened to both be top 10 games competitors, they squatted all the way down, and then they would jump up, <laughs> and you're like... And they got like this high off the ground. <laughs> you're like, what is going on? You're like, oh, 
you cannot figure out how to create tension in order to explode and jump. And this is chicken and the egg, but it's like, well, who's going to survive and thrive in the sport across when you're doing 200 thrusters? The guy who has yeah. no tension through the entire range of motion and doesn't have a sticking point? Or the guy who has a sticking point three inches above parallel and clips that every time he's doing a squat? What we also see is those athletes like, in my mind, people that I think of as like uh, Travis Mayer or Noah Olson, they never fucking get injured. Like mm-hmm. I... I've seen their training, like I know what they do on a day-to-day basis. They're never injured, they never have tightness, they're never stiff, they're not the guys that need eight hours of mobility, or a lot of those delivery limited athletes that I've worked with or that we have on site, they're always injured. They're so always they're a danger to themselves. Yeah, like they just have so much Some walking tension. Walking ball tension, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're ah! so yeah, and shit awesome. when they do CrossFit, because they might do a 95-pound thruster and cut off blood flow to their legs so it's like okay it's basically hypertrophy training at that point anytime you create a blockage in the muscle your heart's going to be driven to push through that and i don't know how far we want to get down this rabbit hole and i don't know how much stake i put in like this line of research but if we're thinking about like polyvagal type theory stuff like if you're having to ramp up cardiac out to put to push through tension in the muscle, like one of the things we see on an omega wave is those guys do easy aerobic work and their anaerobic indexes go through the roof. Mm. And you're like, well, maybe they just have really terrible intramuscular coordination. Like they could contract really well, but they can't relax the muscle. And so that's going to create a whole host of issues. What's their perceived exertion like in something like that? Like could, could a person like that uh, be thinking that they're, completely doing low end work and then you're watching them on a moxie or whatever other uh technology you have and you're just seeing them you're like well how are you doing this and they're just chilling like what what do they look like doing metcons they're the ones that tend to suffer more but doing low intensity aerobic work like spinning on the salt like at a low effort one of the things that i have seen is a lot of those guys they still get arterial occlusion when they're doing that Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much that ends up influencing adaptation, but one of the things you see in like the middle distance world is the best track and field coaches, they have systems that parse people out and they kind of parse them out on the lines of respiratory and delivery. So I know I think of a guy like Steve Magnus and he talks, he classifies athletes based on fiber type, but he's like, when you have a fast twitch runner, you can't just go give them 60 minutes of easy aerobic work. You might give them three sessions of 20 minutes split throughout the day, or if you're doing threshold work instead of five 1K repeats, you'd give them 25 sets of 200 meters. And through the lens that I would look at it, we have kind of come to the same thing. I'm like a delivery limited athlete. If they're a runner, I'm not giving them five by 1K, I'm giving them 25 by 200 so they could relax the muscle between those repeats, get O2 into the muscle. So I think um, on the easy aerobic work, they might not notice a difference, but I think the difference is probably there and it might influence how they adapt. And then the higher effort the work gets, I think that's where you start to really notice it. Like I, I come from an 800 meter running background and we had dudes on the team that looked like me and we had dudes that ran 800s and were at the same time and were built like Ryan if he lost 30 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> As I was saying that, I'm like, no, they're they're wrong, guys. <laughs> He's but, having like, a <laughs> have, you, have you seen Ryan? At least, maybe they have my haircut or something. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, he's actually yeah, surprisingly yeah. athletic. <laughs> surprisingly, he's surprisingly <laughs> athletic, uh, like, but not in anything athletic. Like, he can overhead squat. Yeah, yeah, no, I can't. If, it, if there's like a ball involved, yeah. no chance. But I mean, you look at an 800 meter runner. They're either built like two milers or 400 meter runners, and the guys that were 400 meter runners are the ones who just get punished when we would do training, like they would finish a session and some of them would literally throw up on themselves mm-hmm. and the guys that were built like me we are fine you walk away from it and you're like ah, oh, not a big deal so i think the best coaches have figured out all these things and maybe they weren't explaining it in the same way like one of my favorite track coaches famously said like i don't know what anaerobic versus aerobic means but i know how to train athletes based on what i see mm-hmm. yeah so i'm i'm uh I'm just interested with that. If someone you you know we prescribe like something like nasal breathing work or whatever, so you would you would assume that it's going to be lower end stuff. But it's sounding like even for someone who's delivery limited, uh, they could still technically be breathing in through the nose and still feel like they're relaxed, but still be occluding, and they could be taken away from their adaptation reserves or recovery. Is that is that right? Is that possible? Yeah, that's what I'd be thinking. God you could create. It. You could. You Did could be today. great. You could be creating a respiratory limitation in a delivery limited athlete. <laughs> yeah, with the nasal. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
the nasal breathing. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. just it, it, two birds, zero. Two stones, zero birds. So, which kind of leads you? You mentioned the bike. You mentioned the assault bike. One of the one of the conundrums to me. One of the things that obviously gets us pretty mad in the in the, in the bodybuilding world is like, how do we see these velodrome guys with these just absolutely massive quads? Photoshop. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Have I, you I, ever I, seen them in person? I, I've never seen them in person. Dude, yeah, I only see memes. Yeah, dude, synthol. <laughs> Synthol. <laughs> so you can you can use oil, right? Where where, where is the oil pathway? They all are very tame. Yeah, we'll that, that's yes. after that's right after glycolysis, right? You just start breaking down synthol for for ATP. <laughs> I mean, no, but seriously, why do we see these dudes? I mean, why are sprinters so fucking jacked? Like a track sprinter, like in yeah. my mind, it's like okay, well, the body doesn't speak the language of movement; it speaks the language of tension and energetics in the muscle. So presumably, if they're sprint cyclists probably generating a shit ton of tension in the muscle. They're probably getting a lot of desaturation. I don't see why they wouldn't be creating a lot of mechanical tension or getting motor unit recruitment while they're doing that. And you think about the training volume that most cyclists are doing, it's fucking absurd. So why can't that be a large volume of effective volume for hypertrophy? Well, it's so crazy because that's the argument I hear against like muscular tension being ne- being necessary yeah, exactly. because because like jump training doesn't do it like mm-hmm. like even like high velocity without like slow bar speeds like high velocity without you know moving I'm mm-hmm. not, i don't know what i'm trying to say but like you, they, can't, you can't just move super fast with low load yeah, yeah like yeah. that's not going to do it like you do sets of five at 30 percent at max velocity you're not going to get yeah, hypertrophy yeah. so mm-hmm. why are these why are these sprinters and these cyclists why are they able to get hypertrophy when they're not they're external well maybe that's the key because they're they are working at these i don't know you, you take it man I'm, i don't fucking know yeah i mean i think we would just be speculating but in my mind i'm like okay well these athletes they're producing a lot of force Presumably, if they're sprint cyclists, like a good sprinter is probably not getting complete arterial occlusion when they're sprinting because then they would have no speed endurance. So presumably, they're probably getting at least venous occlusion. And if they're pushing their event close to failure, they're probably getting full desaturation of the muscle. So why wouldn't they be getting increased motor unit recruitment from that? So that could potentially be a reason why it would lead to mechanical tension hypertrophy. That being said, like, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at that, so... That's why, that's why I think that, because I do kind of lean towards this, this hypoxia thing. Like, I think there probably is something to it because the, I mean, how does like that tension compare to, to a 10 RM or something? I don't know, but they've had that, there's that sprint paper now where they just sprinted people and they got bigger in their upper body. So, but what does that say? Because there's, there's not a whole, there's definitely not a whole lot of lengthening going on in, in those contractions. Like they're not overloading that way. Like. It, it's yeah they're creating a bunch of force but I, it doesn't seem like it's it's the same i i, I mean i guess you said like the, the body doesn't know what shit you're doing it's it's only reacting to the to the uh to the stimulus but yeah i don't know it, to me it kind of points towards like there might be something to blood flow occlusion for maybe certain people or or something i i, I don't know like, what do you think is going on there I mean, are we talking about like running and sprinting that got hypertrophy in their upper body? Because if we're thinking about the rotational forces that get yeah, generated yeah, on yeah. someone sprinting, you're almost doing iso inertial training in the upper body if you're doing a max effort sprint. But isometrics yeah. typically don't cause a whole lot of muscle growth. Yeah. Well, do we know that though? Like, I know there's an the argument like what IFBB pros use isometrics, but like, Isometrics are pro- possibly the least sexy type of training protocol you could come up with. Yeah, so like has anyone ever really run too. like I thought a there program was where some... they're doing a ton of yeah, heavy I, I, isometrics to failure? I'm, I'm yeah, pretty I, sure I can Knuckles... Pull, um, I, can, I can pull that study. Some stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know that I looked at it, but but I only know of, of one study and I don't know it in detail. Um, so, But that's just my understanding. But like, I, I think I, I totally agree with you there. Like, nobody's doing that. Like no one's actually putting in, and, and I don't I don't know what the the protocol was like for that that thing. Um, so yeah, I, it's it's because I think of, I mean Ben and I came up with, really mostly Ben. Uh, if it's a good idea, I'd say it was my idea, but it's a ter- terrible idea. So Ben Ben came up with this thing of the uh, there was a t- the 20, 20 rep front squat at body weight into uh, in a minute you have to get in a minute and then you rest for a minute and then you do uh, fifteen bench at body weight. It's the worst thing ever. 
Uh, it was less like 30 seconds, actually. And then if you get those, then you go to go on the, the Airdyne bike for your, your victory ride. And then it's a one <laughs> sprint. So, and that thing, like, I mean, I've done some, like, some fucked up workouts and some hard stuff. But mm-hmm. the, the, uh, what was so crazy about that after that one minute, because it's an all out sprint, because we're all idiots. We didn't try to, like, think about pacing. It was like you, your cardiovascular system would, would just tank, like you, you throw up or whatever, and that would take a couple of minutes to go away, but it would go away, but then you still have this like insane pump in your legs. Well, like you just dude, couldn't get rid of it. Well, think about this. So we know generally, I think we could probably say all human beings, your skeletal muscle has the vasodilator capacity to outstrip your cardiac output. So if you vasodilated all the muscles in your body, your heart would not be able to maintain your arterial blood pressure and you'd die in ah, fucking 20 so that's, seconds. So that's the best way to get big. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, the best way to get <laughs> Matt, the best way, the best pump ever, your last pump <laughs> your last ever. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, so the body has a protective mechanism against that. It's the cardiac metabol reflex. So hypothetically, if you're doing a very intensive work in your lower body and you're not someone that has really good cardiac output, you're going to vasodilate your lower body to do that work, and you're going to vasoconstrict the upper limbs in your body, and that's going to make it easier to maintain your arterial blood pressure because if you keep your upper body vasodilated and your vasodilated in your lower body, your heart has to work that much faster to maintain arterial blood pressure. So if you're doing those front squats, now you're challenging your ability to redirect the blood flow back into your upper body, which is going to put your heart under a lot of stress. So in all reality, if you're someone who doesn't do a lot of whole body exercise like CrossFit, you're probably going to be more occluded in your upper body doing those bench press than you would otherwise. So you're going to be creating more of that pump where you see like, I mean, I think that's why you see so many CrossFitters getting yoked from doing CrossFit is they have a poor ability to redirect blood flow where the guys that are really good at redirecting blood flow, the ones that CrossFit literally looks like cyclical work in the muscle, they don't carry that much muscle. Think of like a Fikowski or a Travis Mayer. Like they definitely carry some mass. They're strong dudes, but they're built nothing like a Jason Kuip or a Neil Maddox or that type of athlete. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we recently did a podcast about uh, training to failure and just some kind of hypothetical rationale for why you might not want to do that or just training under fatigue, training to the point where you're starting to see drop off in your performance but as I'm, as I'm hearing you say that, I'm kind of thinking like maybe there is a person that would benefit from doing that. Like, cause it sounds like these, cause essentially these CrossFitters are doing, they're going and doing a, a 400 meter sprint and then they're getting on the bench press and their bench press performance, I would assume is less than it, what it normally would be uh, had they not just done a 400 meter sprint. But you're saying that they are occluding in their, in their chest, like if they're delivery limited, uh, if I, if I'm understanding it correctly. They, they are going to occlude more in their, their pecs than they normally would had they not just done a 400 meter sprint. Hence, they're getting higher motor unit recruitment because of that. So for that person, maybe they would, maybe those people do benefit from doing shit where they're seeing substantial drop off. Maybe like doing drop sets for those people is yeah, something it's that would be- junk volume for them, junk volume. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's where we have to wonder too. It's like, well, at that 400 meter, if we're driving up like, hypothetically, once they start benching, if they're getting increased peripheral fatigue, well, then maybe they're actually getting a big enough drop off that they're not desaturating that muscle. Like, I always think about if we're think, like talking in terms of even auto-regulating training, it's like, could someone not do more work because their cardiopulmonary system is their limiter? They either can't get O2 into the body, get CO2 out, get oxygen to the muscle, or is it um, what we'd call a performance baseline, like they could no longer utilize oxygen in the muscle quick enough? And maybe with that 400 meter on bench, maybe they get kicked out because their cardiopulmonary system's the limiter, and then they're going to get fatigued quicker, and maybe that's an issue. But maybe if their cardiopulmonary system is really well developed and they're still able to utilize oxygen in the muscle while doing that, then maybe it's a good protocol for them. I don't know. What, so, what if somebody doesn't, so if somebody doesn't have a lot of time, they could up their cardiopulmonary system, make that not the limiter, and then they could essentially do like what four sets of bench press with like thirty seconds rest, and maybe not have as much drop off. Like, what would you be looking at there? Yeah, because that well, then we're getting to that issue. It's like, well, if someone is so aerobically developed, well, now they're going to be able to get 
blood into the muscle easier. Yeah, so maybe we make it that they're over delivering oxygen to the muscle and we can't desat now. So the way that I'm always thinking is like, let's make them delivery limited, but then increase oxygen flux. So for example, let's say um, I'm literally making up numbers here to make an example, but let's say they're Just double it. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's double it. So they're they're <laughs> utilizing they're utilizing like five units of oxygen in the muscle, and they're delivering four. So they're creating a bigger demand than they could supply. So we keep that supply and demand scenario skewed that they're creating a big demand, but we bump both of those things up. So they're delivering more O2, and they're utilizing more O2. So now they're able to keep doing a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But it is still skewing them towards someone who's delivery limited and could desaturate very quickly. Like, um, I know I've seen some hypertrophy literature where they take two groups and like the group that rests one minute between sets gets less hypertrophy than the group that rests like five minutes between sets. And it's in those cases, what if they're just making the cardiopulmonary system the limiter in the group resting one minute between sets? That's what uh, I wonder too. Like, what know, if you like, control for like VO2 max or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things that I've seen, like one of the protocols that I messed around for auto-regulating training is you have someone do a work set and you establish what we would call performance baseline. So for example, let's say I give you 10 front squats at 250 pounds, rest three minutes, and just keep doing it until you can't desaturate. So you do the 10 front squats at 250, you desaturate the VLs down to 12% SMO2, rest three minutes, and you keep doing it. And eventually those muscles are not going to pull O2 down anymore. So you might go like 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 35% SMO2. And at that point, you're probably getting some kind of compensatory movement pattern to keep yourself going, but you're not training those muscles effectively anymore. And when we play at those kinds of protocols, one of the things that you see is if you space out the rest periods a ton, you could get more sets done in a workout before someone loses the ability to utilize oxygen in the muscle but there's still always a limit. Like when you're training with those very short rest periods, maybe you could get six sets in a workout where maybe on the high end, you could get someone doing like 12 to 15 sets on a muscle before mm. it gets capped out. So when I've been like with my own training, one of the things that I've been doing is like super sets that's like I'm time constrained with my training. I could train like 60 to 90 minutes a day, most days. So I'm like, okay, I don't want to cluster all my training for one muscle group together and lose the ability to desat. So I may mix like hamstring curls with bicep curls. Like it makes no fucking sense, but mm -hmm. I could train those muscles, desaturate them. And I could basically spread my, all my biceps work over that 90 minute period, spread all the hamstrings, all the chest work across that 90 minute period. And it's possible that I'm able to fully desaturate the muscle on more of those work sets. And I'm just getting less volume where I'm not desatting. Gotcha. That's cool. Dang. So if someone's super work capacity limited, you would, would you, or would you not, what kind of block would you run? Or like, are we talking they're limited to the extent that they can't even get enough volume in to be effective? Yeah. So that, that's where I wonder, like, so say someone, say someone stops adapting from 10 sets per week or whatever on the, the low end or whatever. Yeah. And, but but then they go to twelve sets per week, and it's 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 kind of junk volume because they're, maybe they're this is completely hypothetical. But like because the limiters not something muscular related, the limiters they're just like they're not in shape. Well, I remember uh, when I was in Costa Rica with you guys, Ryan was telling me about how he runs like work capacity blocks in his training every so often. It's like well, maybe for that person doing something like that, like we talked about those work capacity blocks probably aren't driving hypertrophy, but they're like training the trainability. They're setting him up so he could handle more volume afterwards. And then maybe that's going to be what drives hypertrophy. So maybe that person who can't handle the volume, we need to train them to be able to handle that volume, knowing that what they're doing at this point in time, it's not getting them more jacked, but maybe it sets them up to do the training that gets them more jacked in two months from now. So yeah, maybe you take that time improve cardiac output, you improve oxygen flux. Maybe there's someone who's going to be able to cope with that kind of training load in a few months. Is there, is there a way that you would measure that? I, I heard you on a, on a podcast talking about uh, kind of like this, this hierarchy of, of oxygenation, I think, if, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly, and that there's, there's a priority that your brain is going to get oxygen first, and then your heart, mm -hmm. vital organs, then working muscles, and then non-working muscles, if I'm describing mm -hmm. the model correctly. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering, and you, and you were talking about uh, putting like a moxie on someone's VL and then putting it on their 
uh, their delt or something, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering if there's a way that you could test someone, like throw them on a leg press, and if you find out that they're starting to desaturate in their delt, then like there they might be someone who's systemically limited that's cardiac limited. Mm -hmm. That might be someone who actually needs one of those work capacity cycles or they need some cardio or whatever it may be. Or you might find that they're they're just deciding in the in the quad and that they're good. Like and so mm -hmm. is there a way because I like because a lot of times I'm you know I'll throw somebody in a bike and I just have like made up numbers. I'm like I, if you get if it takes you more than 13 minutes to get four miles on an echo bike, I, I don't think you're in great shape. We're gonna do a, <laughs> like a a, a, a mm -hmm. A work capacity cycle, but I'm wondering if there's a, the way that you can be more accurate with that with the testing that you're using. Yeah, so that's the thing that's tough because yeah, we could talk about that leg press example where you see them desatting in the delt, and I'm like, well, if this is a person who's trying to get jacked, maybe we want that to happen because that mm -hmm. means they're creating a delivery limitation. Where when I'm using that type of assessment, I'm thinking about a crossfitter. Like, I want them to be able to do a shit ton of work with their legs and not cut off blood flow to their upper body yeah. because I want them to be able to go from squatting a 20 rep max into doing a max set of unbroken chest to bar pull-ups. Mm -hmm. We're training someone to be able to do that. Maybe that's not the best thing if their goal is hypertrophy. Like maybe we want to make them more delivery in the minute. So you could flip it. Like the result of the test might be yeah. like that. Yeah, you might be like, okay, if you're not deciding in your delt, then maybe you need to do less cardio or something. Yeah, like I almost think of the like performance training concepts. It's like a lot of times we probably want to do the opposite for, yeah, yeah, for sure. mm -hmm. hypertrophy athletes. Unless so it's getting in the way of your ability to accumulate volume. That's, yeah, that's yeah. where I'm, I just wonder if there's a way to, to be more precise with assessing that. That's where I go to that fatigue index. Like you were talking about, like, so have a standardized rest interval. And like, I get, I get worried when people, when I see like huge drop offs, right? Where, like if you go from 15 to eight, I'm like, yeah. dude, what, what the hell happened? So like, maybe that's a, maybe that's a better having a standardized way of like, Hey, you're going to do a 15 rep max bench press, they're going to rest two minutes and do it again. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even not a compound movement. Maybe a, it'd be a single joint movement. See, and do you, have you seen those fatigue indexes being really different for different muscle groups? Yeah. So that's one of the things that I found, like my chest has terrible fatigue resistance. Like I'll have huge mm -hmm. drop offs, but my lower body, like I could take a squat, set of squats at 90% to failure within three minutes. I could repeat it again. I could probably do it four or five my four or five more times and it's not gonna have much of a drop off at all. Do you think, I wonder if that has, because I thought about that particular example a lot because I'm the same way and I see it a lot. I wonder, I just think it, it, it might just be that you have, there's just more compensations available in a squat. Yeah, a I, press yeah I mean, that could definitely be it. Um, but I don't know. Have Come you on. thought about like 3D cameraing this? Like that's that's what yeah. I would I would be interested in like seeing like when you see that SM, SMO2 not drop, like what kind of if they're squat if they're front squatting or whatever, like are they just like going to erectors? Like how the hell are they getting this done? Yeah, so I have I have thought about 3D cameraing it, but like we just end up dealing with cost at some point. So I have this project that I've been wanting to do for a while. So um, are you familiar with Neuroxin, like the little mini? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, motions. Yeah, so imagine we get 3D cameras, almost like a like a Nike Sport Research Lab, like their motion capture system, Moxies and Neuroxons. That's what I want. And I've been trying to get this funded for the longest time. So print more money. Just yeah, just print more money. Yeah, I mean, I I do that. No one accepts it. It's it, it's really unfortunate. <laughs> He's got to buy a monopoly game. Listen, dude, there's another stimulus check. Coming. I got a two thousand dollar bill right here. I, I still didn't get mine. I think it got lost in the mail a few weeks ago. <laughs> I'm sure Max cashed it for you. Yeah, maybe. Okay, but maybe. this idea that I've had because um, like there are some correlations between like I know EMG is like its own issues, but um, one of the things that you see is like as a muscle progressively desaturates or tissue oxygenation index decreases, like the amplitude on EMG goes up in relation with that. That's that whole oxygen conforming response. So how much is the mild motion? Like nine, what is that? Because they have the kit. It depends on how many EMGs you get, but it, it like, it's up to like 20, but I think you can get it for nine, right? Yeah. The amount of sensors that I wanted to buy when I looked, it was about 12,000. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot. But I like you might be able to. I, I know of some labs that have them. You have mm -hmm. the mox. I like. I think of like how can we collaborate on resources, right? Like, 
we have we have the the ultrasound and the the Tendo units. I have a guitar. Yeah, <laughs> Ryan has a guitar. Yeah, and I mean, I know be... you both have skateboards. <laughs> yeah, we both have. Like how, how can we, we, put, we all have hats? <laughs> we all have hats. Yeah. How can we put this all together? So we we gotta have enough stuff in our houses. <laughs> I'm talking <laughs> to my friend Theo. Theo's been on Marketplace. He's been selling shit. <laughs> he'll turn he'll turn a cap eraser into a into a 3D camera. Just give him three months. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be doable. Like right now, I, I, anything that I buy sports science wise, like thermal cameras, moxies, like I just pay for all that out of pocket. So I'm like, uh, I'm not really looking to drop 12 G's yeah. on an Roxxon that I want for one experiment. Yeah. yeah, but I feel like I feel like you could we could use that. Uh, I know I know Kasim is he might be he might be pulling the trigger on it um, on buying the mild motion with the EMG stuff. So I think we could get we could you have you have the people you have the moxies, Ryan and I have hats. Yeah. <laughs> like, We're definitely a part of this. Some, some, it's an somehow, even contribution. Somehow but... we can make our way into this maneuver, uh, but I, I I I think that to like it, it to collaborate, I think it's an interesting question. I think together, I I, mean, I completely understand. Like twelve grand is 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 a lot of money, but I. I Somebody's somebody out there has it, so we just have to find them. I'd be friends with that person. Yeah, I mean, well, that, what do you see? What do you see? Just like with your eyes, like, do you see anything that's super apparent when you when you're watching, like, an example? Example of what? We forgot the we were squat. talking. No, yeah, the, I squat, the, yeah. the squat, the squat. Yeah. Where so they they, they no, can't desaturate no, anymore. Like you're like, damn, this person can't desaturate. Why aren't they? Why aren't they desaturating their VLs? Well, they're not using their. Are they using their VLs or are they using something else? What kind of compensatory strategy is it? Yeah, so that's where it raises the question of it's like, are they, if you could visually see someone changing their recruitment pattern, are they doing that because they lose the ability to desat the primary working muscle? So now they need a compensatory movement strategy to keep them going? Or are they not desaturating because they've initiated a compensatory movement strategy? Like, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I could guess based on watching things on video, but. I don't know if we could really say for sure based on the information that we know right now, which is why I think it would be interesting to um, add some of these other technologies to it. So that that fatigue where we don't – God, this is crazy. So the complexity of this is so cra- – like we don't know how the fatigue is happening. It's probably inorganic phosphate, so they can't contract anymore. And because they be, – and then the O2 measurement is essentially our proxy for that fatigue state. Yeah, I mean, I. That's what I'd be thinking. Like, if the muscle is fatigued, if you can't contract the muscle, you're not going to be utilizing oxygen in that muscle. So I think it's using O2 as a proxy for that. So what is that desaturation in the muscle actually telling us? Like when they go to zero, it's it's saying there's. What is that saying? So. If we're talking about a zero steady state, that basically means someone's bottomed out O2 and they're just getting enough into the muscle to be able to continue contracting. But if someone truly bottoms out to zero, it means they've utilized all the oxygen in that muscle. So now they're going to have to create some kind of compensatory pattern to keep going, which is where you see a difference between if someone's doing a localized movement, like how you're doing a bicep curl and you hit 0%, like you could still use your anterior delt to create shoulder flexion and curl it up. If you're doing systemic movement, like you're assault biking and you're, you go down to 0%, that's where you see people like they'll chicken wing the bike to try and keep going. And it doesn't work because they're trying to default to muscles that still have oxygen saturation. As soon as they do it, those muscles desat because they're limited by supply. And that's where you see people like turn to stone where they just stop being able to move. So do you think this is intramuscular and arterial? Like why are they going to zero? Both? Yeah, I mean, it could be that they're cutting off blood flow to the arteries so there's no arterial inflow. Or it could just be that they are trying to utilize at a way higher rate than they are capable of delivering. So it's almost like, yeah, it's like you're digging a hole. Like, say, I'm like, okay, Ben, I'm going to dig a hole and you throw a shovel of dirt in my hole as I'm digging. And I just start digging faster than you could fill it up or it could be creating a bigger hole. Yeah. Surplus checks and credit card debt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> damn your whole, damn you, damn your story, uh, man. Anything that this has been super fun. Thank you. Anything else you want to talk about, Ryan or Evan? 
I guess, you know, I'm always thinking, um, you know, like how do, is there any way that we can find proxies for these proxies? <laughs> because that's really what they are, right? Like, mm -hmm. is there any way that we can kind of identify, uh, you know, when, when we've lost the, the ability to, to actually train the muscle that we think that we are, is there, are we going to feel that in any way? Like, are you, are you just, I'm just really curious, like what your feedback is from, from the people that you've run these tests on. And like, what are, what are they feeling subjectively? Does it matter? Do you care? Like, is there any way to use that information? Yeah. So I think in terms of feeling, so, um, as reference, like my dad's a bodybuilder, he's been training for like 40 years. And one of the things that I always used to hear him talk about is when he like is super overtrained, like you just can't get a pump anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And totally. I'm like, okay, maybe that has to do with all these different molecules or it's like, well, maybe if you're just really, really fatigued, you can't get enough muscle recruitment to yeah. create a, like your maximum voluntary contraction isn't great enough to get venous occlusion. So I think there's something to be said about that. One of the things that I've also personally felt, have you ever tried to like the way that I had tried to train like 10 years ago, I'd be like, I'm going to do 30 sets of chest work in this workout. And yeah, after yeah. like 10 Monday. or 12 sets, you're like, I just don't feel my chest. Like I just can't get a pump anymore. You kind of get an anti-pump. It's so it's yeah. funny. Yeah. And you, I often would find that I wouldn't be as sore the following day as I normally would be had I not done that. <laughs> did you yeah. do like, did you do a bunch of volume and then do a bunch of recovery work for that volume? <laughs> in the Basically, session? I think that's what, honestly, I think that's what would happen. Seriously. It's like, if you're not getting a pump, it's like, well, you're probably not getting enough recruitment to drive hypertrophy. So yeah. now you're basically just getting compression reactions and flushing yeah. out the yeah. tissue. Yeah. yeah. yeah you're, you're doing, you're doing well, bona fide foam roll. Cause you got to get rid of that lactate, bro. Yeah. I mean, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. Cause yeah. So I think about that stuff. I also it brings me to the idea of uh, like I think I've talked to you a little bit about this this theory and that it seems that the people that like the muscles that fucking grow on people are the ones that they just get like super pumps on. Like I I literally I'll go for a walk and I have a pump in my lats. And it's like, is there anything? <laughs> I I just wonder if in, as I hear you well, talking you do, about you do you do I I'm doing. <laughs> Side contractions every step. Right? You <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't walk around. Look, all right, it's, it's relaxed. It's relaxed. Boom. All right. Okay. So I, I don't walk around like that all day. Yes, I do. Um, so <laughs> I, I wonder if there is something to this, this uh, occlusion, like occlusion or capillarity or what, like what, it, whatever it is, uh, and, and what people are subjectively feeling. Like, because I'm, I take it a step further. It's like, hey, if I have someone who can't ever get a pump in their quads, like maybe I blood flow restrict that person and just get some shit happening there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what, what your thoughts are on any of that stuff. So one of the things that I think about the blood flow restriction is like, well, hypothetically, some let's say someone is incapable of getting enough recruitment to utilize oxygen in that tissue. Is BFR going to do anything for them? Yeah, they're already not doing it anyway, right? Yeah, so, so now you're doing like doubly nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the way that I've been thinking about so, BFR is, it's almost like, what's their limitation? Like, this is really ah. So you would use it in like Travis Mayer or Fikowski if they wanted to get big. Yeah, because like for Travis, someone like that, like they over deliver O2 to their muscle, so you could restrict the ability of blood and O2 to get in. It might be an effective strategy for them. Those guys usually are not the ones getting a, a massive pump, right? That. Yeah, they're the ones yeah, that don't okay. get pumped out doing CrossFit. Or like yeah, that's, that's previously, how I'm thinking, yeah. Like when I did a CrossFit um, for a few years, I had never gotten limited in a workout because I was pumped. Like that just didn't exist for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dude, that's crazy. I was like the complete opposite. I was like when you talked about Kyle Roots, like that was that was me. Like I, I like I'd do a set of wall balls and I would like my but quads then, would just. But like, look at how much your quads have grown too. That's what makes yeah. me think of it. It's like you you go there first, and that so it's like yeah. I guess that again, like it's like how do we create maybe? And I've been moxie. I've been moxie. I'm a high gluter for sure. You're high like, gluter, yeah. So like everywhere, like we. Well, because in the beginning of CrossFit, like you had, you're like, dude, you had all these people, like, why, like someone, because it wasn't a big sport, right? So people were like, we'll bring all these free, we'll bring like a free safety from the league over, and they're gonna, they're gonna dominate CrossFit. It never happened, because these, mm -hmm. all, all these other athletes from like, in, like other sports, they they got funneled in there because they were such, they were tension monsters, and so they they were high occluders, and then you put them in CrossFit, and they were terrible. Whereas like the CrossFitters that got did really good, generally they weren't super athletic. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they were they maybe they were an endurance sport yeah. or something. You yeah. can find exceptions to every rule. But like I remember one of my buddies was a free safety and he was a D1 safety. Dude was just an animal. But anything past three minutes, he was 
he was donezo. Like he was like he was just pumped out. You're like, damn, that's an ogre, but he couldn't move anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think a good CrossFit athlete fundamentally, like I know people always say, oh, you get the most talented athletes and they'll dominate. No, I think the best CrossFit athlete by virtue of the physiology that makes you a good CrossFitter is not going to be great at anything because mm -hmm. the best CrossFit athletes, like they might squat 500 pounds. If we're talking about the realm of strength sports, that's not an impressive back squat by any means. You look at their 2K rows, people are like, oh, 615, 2K, incredible. That's a pretty high level high school rower. <laughs> yeah. So like, like you, literally you look at some of the best CrossFitters 2K row scores and a good rower could hold that for a 10K or more. Yeah. So they're they're just not great at anything, but by virtue of being able to be pretty good at everything, that's what makes you very good at CrossFit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're also psychologically, from what I've, what, my contact with them, you get the people that are not, they don't get up as much as like you say, you, you bring a running back in there. Like that dude's going to get up for workouts and he's going to get up too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the best CrossFitters are not the like stereotypical CrossFitters that are like super like hyped up there. Like they approach it like craftsmen, like it's very straightforward. It's not, it's a little bit more cold and calculating, I'd say. But, but I, I could definitely outwork all those people, though, right? That's no, yeah, I mean, of course. I think the issue is that no one's coming. They're not working hard enough. It's just well on a just grind and go beast mode. That's, that's the, the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. I, I think it would. I think. I think it would be absolutely amazing if Ryan tried to do CrossFit. I think you'd be really good because if I, they I, took out the damn gymnastics, I would. <laughs> what do you mean? You could. You just have to lose like 10, 15 pounds. In kilos. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's the gymnastics. I don't want to do a muscle up. I don't want to learn. It's not. I don't have the patience. I don't want to walk on my hands. I can. It's just too much. Uh, but otherwise, I would be the the uh, the champion of the world in CrossFit. That's the only reason why. That's what it is. The world championships, right? I just watched them. They had them on Netflix. So, serious so, question: okay. What is the largest person that you think could do a kickflip? Because if we're talking about the two most important things in the world, the hypertrophy, uh, skate, well, yeah. Skateboard, At what yeah. point do you specialize in getting the interference effects between those two things? Well, I think I'm actually experiencing that right now because I just started skateboarding again and I lost weight. So this direct really, it's it's like it's like my body knows what I really want to do. It's like I really want to be a skateboarder. It, uh, uh, it's it's kind of helping to facilitate that. I actually can't be a part of this conversation because I I can't kick flip. I can only heel flip. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Right. It's super weird. It, it, isn't a heel flip supposed to be harder than a kickflip? Ben, you, you just tune this out. This is like when you talk about football, and I'm just like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it only took 75 minutes for me to get tuned out of the conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> disappointed in you guys. I think I'm actually with you because kick flipping, I think, is easier than heel flipping, but I was able to laser flip before I could tray flip, and a laser flip should be harder, and a laser flip is a 360 heel yeah. versus a 360 kick. Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, have you moxied it? I, don't <laughs> I haven't moxied it yet, but you know, now that you I'm, say it. I'm actually like the most confusing individual ever because we talked about uh, like the people that just that just drop, like they, they do the vertical jump and they have to like go into a deep squat before they do it. Like that's that's what I have to do when I when I jump like for on a skateboard. Like anytime I do an ollie or anything, I have to like I have to drop. Like I literally like touch the ground. So I, I think uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe I am uh, meant to do CrossFit and skateboard. Could be. I think so. I think I, I'm just think you've it. spent like, how many years wasting all of your time lifting weights? When what was I thinking? I should have been. I've been reading and lifting weights. I should have been skateboarding and smoking pot. I don't know. Is that CrossFitting? Yeah, yeah. Gymnastics. Yeah, gymnastics. Yeah, gymnastics. Not a chance. <laughs> yes. But I can almost do a backflip. So that's pretty good. That's so close. I sent you that video. It was scary, right? Yeah, you, you 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 sink in air. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, like the regular you, you say, the formulas for gravity don't are, don't apply to. Yeah, people. you might be one of the least aerodynamic people I've ever seen, and I mean that in the best way. <laughs> no, that's a huge compliment. I, I really appreciate it. It's working on the waste, dude. Uh, all right, man, Evan. Where can people learn more about you? This was a super fun conversation. Where where can they find out more? Uh. Pretty much everything I do is on Instagram because I don't have a website. So it's just Evan, E-V-A-N underscore P-I-K-O-N. That's my handle. That's where I put out all my content. All right. We'll, we'll tag you up. Uh, give Evan a follow. He, he, you have to be aware, though, he is going to put out weird shit. 
like every other week, <laughs> just, just to kind of weed his followers out. So like if you, it, like if you get some like Tolstoy thing, like you're like, what the fuck is this dude talking about? Just hang on. <laughs> he's just trying to he's just trying to get out those. He's just trying to weed him out. Uh, and so thank you, man. I, Ryan and I both appreciate you. You're in Atlanta. Uh, when I when I maybe we can find somebody with 3D cameras and make all make all this happen uh, for for you, obviously, because. Because <laughs> we have hats. <laughs> yeah, we're well, we're we're the middlemen. We just we're gonna get the three D cameras to you, but then we want to use them. Uh, yeah, sweet. <laughs> yeah, once I get them, I can drive. It's like the, the post. It, oh, it's like the kid that comes over, like, hey, come over. I want to see your. I want I want to play with you. And you take his toy. <laughs> <laughs> that was me every single time. I'd call my friends. I'd like, hey man, you want to play PlayStation? He's like, I'm not home. Like, it's cool. I didn't ask you if you wanted to be there. Like, I just, I'm going to come over and play your PlayStation. That's fine. It's perfect. So, so like, whenever you get those 3D cameras, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll actually know. We'll probably have the tracking order before you. And when, and when they just arrive, when they arrive at your house with the leaf blower, that's going to be us. Me. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be like, 3D cameras. Oh, I just happen to have these weights. Let's front squat. <laughs> yeah, better yet, I'm gonna start a messaging company saying, "Hey, my name's Dr. Ben House. I've got twenty five thousand followers. Let me check out your cameras. I'll post yeah. all I'm that." Try, I'm, so. I'm, I'm try. Try. <laughs> Believe me, I try that angle with as many people. <laughs> yeah, you say he's definitely tried that. I do it. I try that angle, hey. and then and then I'll tag my wife. I'd be like, "Hey, my yeah. wife." My, I'll act like I'm a spokesperson for my wife. I did it through the leg press. I was like, "Hey." <laughs> I really, I'm really interested in this leg press. I'm running some studies on it. My wife is really, really interested though. <laughs> Here's her account. Her friend, Aaron Kelly Art, also really interested. Check out her account. Uh, so yeah. maybe, maybe I get some 3D cameras. Yeah, that's okay. are always like all of my friends combined have 10,000 followers. So isn't that enough to give me some 3D cameras? <laughs> Just start tagging every one of your followers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this follower has other followers, I mean, it, it compounds. Yeah, as, that, a, as a community, we will buy, know. as a community, no one else will buy your product. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you better do it or we're just gonna talk shit. Yeah, time. we operate as a hive mind. <laughs> <laughs> we're just gonna share this. Can you give it to us for free? And no one's actually gonna purchase anything. <laughs> yeah, that's how we do it. Thank you for the like press. See you later. A lot of complexity. I think yeah. the, the simple side of simple is, is pretty dangerous, but understanding the complexity, mm -hmm. appreciating it, respecting it, and then getting to the, the practical applications, which I think, like, we'll just leave this in the episode. Like, what are your practical applications with Moxie? Like, you got you got one practical application. What is it? Oh, is this an actual question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, like, just, I, I we think, just restarted like, the podcast. We just restarted the podcast. This happens all the time. You got so what, what, is, what is the simple side of complexity for you? Like, what is your one thing? Like, someone has a moxie. They, they, this has been super confusing for them. What is your one practical takeaway that, that, you, that you would use that you think won't get them in trouble? Yeah, I mean, I think with the moxie, like, I like the term, it's like that game level intervention. Like, obviously, there's all this complexity. There's, what, 10,000 things happening in the muscle simultaneously. We know oxygen is important in one way or another. So instead of thinking about these zones, these different percent one rep maxes, like throw all of that out. We're just thinking about what is happening inside of that specific muscle that you're training. We could throw everything out and boil it down to something that simple. And I think that leads to a lot of really straightforward applications for training and individualizing training without having to complicate the hell out of everything because that's what I'm prone to doing.